Let's turn to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 12. And we're going to be looking at some different passages of Scripture tonight. We're in the midst of a series on Sunday nights about living through relationships. And sometimes we are called to deal with people at work or at home or at school or wherever we are that can be difficult to deal with. And they stress us and stretch us. And so the Bible gives us some keys to relationship peace. And I'm going to give you a checklist tonight of three things right from the Word of God that you have to have if you're going to have relationship peace. And if you don't have these three things, you're in for a rough ride relationally. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say if you're thinking about getting married, and all of these I'm going to use marriage to kind of teach this session tonight, but these apply to any relationship. But if you're thinking about getting married, and you certainly ought to teach your children this and your grandchildren this, and your prospective spouse does not meet these three biblical criteria that I'm going to share with you about healthy relationships, it ought to be a deal breaker. And I don't know any other way to say it than to just say it like that. It ought to be a deal breaker. No matter how cute they are, no matter how much money they have, no matter what you think about them, if they don't meet these three criteria from God's Word, then it ought to be a deal breaker. And one of these days, if you don't heed this, you're going to wish you had. So let's begin by Proverbs 12, standing together out of respect to God's Word. And we're going to look at one verse, verse 26. The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. Just simple words, but how great the wisdom. Look at it again. The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. Father, help us to choose our friends carefully, understanding that if we're not careful, we will be led astray. And Lord, we ask you to help us tonight to build into our relationships these three keys to relationship peace in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. And let me just ask you to turn first to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 as we look at this first uh, key to relationship peace. 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. The first qualification to relationship peace is spiritual unity. Spiritual unity. The Bible is extremely clear about this. We have to have spiritual unity if we're going to have relationship peace. We're going to have to believe the same thing about God. Look with me, if you will, at 2 Corinthians there and find the 6th chapter. And notice what God teaches us there in verses 14 and 15. And This is true in marriage. It's true in business. It's true in any relationship. Look at what it says. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial or the devil? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Now, folks, it can't get much clearer than that, can it? I mean, here's what he's saying. If you want relationship peace, the first key is spiritual unity. Your relationship to God should be the most important thing in your life. And if you can't share the most important thing in your life with your spouse, then you're living on different wavelengths and you're headed for trouble. If you want God's blessing in your marriage, God has to be at the center. He's got to be the glue. Most people don't really understand how important this is and how important God is to to marriage. But listen, it takes more than a man and a woman to make a marriage. Did you know that? 
The Bible tells us that. Remember, marriage is God's idea. He designed it. God thought it up. God thought up intimacy. God thought up the family and children and the whole thing. He designed it. And God designed marriage to be like a three-legged stool. I want you to, to think about this for a minute. There is God, there is a husband, and there is a wife. You take any one of the legs out of that stool and the stool is going to fall over. A one-legged stool will fall over. A two-legged stool will fall over. But God teaches us here that you have to have God in the relationship, any relationship, and especially the marriage relationship, or it's going to be unstable. In other words, if you don't have spiritual unity, how can you expect to be unified? if there's no spiritual unity. After watching a lot of divorces through the years, I've gotten to the point where I'm blunt, and, and that's one reason I don't officiate at a lot of weddings anymore. People don't ask me to do that very often anymore because they know how I feel about it, and I, they know where I stand, and I stand where God's Word stands. And so I'm just blunt about it, and if there is a believer and an unbeliever, I'm not going to do it. I just say no. Because it's not scriptural. You say, well, pastor, does that not make people mad? Sometimes it does. Sometimes they leave the church over it. But you don't compromise the word of God to please somebody. Can you say amen? God's word is true. And this is what God's word says. Look at it there with me again. I mean, it's clear. Notice what he says in this passage of scripture. Verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? You know, I love people enough to tell them the truth, even when sometimes they don't want to hear it. And so if you don't have spiritual unity, you're never going to have the kind of relationship that God intended, the emotional unity or the spiritual unity that God intended. Let me give you the hard cold facts. Now, this is not preference. This is, this, these are facts. A national survey reported one out of every two and a half marriages in America end in divorce. Did you get that? One out of every two and a half. That's not good odds. But when a couple is spiritually unified, like Scripture teaches us here, they're both believers and they practice three habits. They attend church together, they pray together, and they read the Bible together. The divorce rate drops from one out of every two and a half to one out of every 1,500 marriages. Isn't that something? That's quite a difference. And so it teaches us that if we marry without spiritual unity, more than likely in 10 years we'll be divorced. General rule is you won't beat the odds, or you'll stay together, but you will not experience the deepest intimacy that God intends. So this is the starting point. God says in our relationships, the key to relationships begins with spiritual unity. Jot down Romans 1.12. Let me read it to you. And this is a paraphrase. It says, I want us to help each other with the faith we have. Your faith will help me, and my faith will help you. And that's when we're spiritually unified, our faith strengthens each other. And that's what God wants to do in a marriage. He wants the faith of the husband to help the wife and the faith of the wife to help the husband. And how can faith help each other if one has no faith? So if I were to stand up here, for example, if I stood on the edge of this platform and, and I said, Mike, come and pull me down, just don't really pull me down, but <laughs> what do you want me to do? I want you just to stand there and act like you're going to pull me down. Is it easier for you to pull me down or easier for me to pull you up? I can pull you down pretty easy. That's right. It's a lot easier for somebody to pull you down than it is to pull you up. And that's why God says be careful. Don't be unequally yoked. There has to be spiritual unity. But that's not enough. There's something else. Turn over in the Old Testament to the book of Amos, the book of Amos, chapter 3. 
Amos, the third chapter in the Old Testament. I'm going to give you a minute. That's a hard one to find. Amos chapter 3. When you get it, just look up here, and I'll know when it's about time to move on. Amos chapter 3. And here's the second relationship key. Amos, the third chapter. And look at the third verse. And notice what God says here. Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? Can two walk together unless they agree? That's what Scripture says. So now he's talking about a second relationship key. There has to be spiritual unity, but there also has to be a shared life purpose. A shared life purpose purpose you can't walk one way and your spouse walk another way and the two of you walk together and if two people cannot walk together with the same purpose how in the world do they think they can live together in intimacy it's not going to happen the marriage won't last if you have a purpose for your life and I have a purpose for my life that is different from your purpose it's, it's not going to last. It's going to end in disaster or conflict. And the implication of this is that we're not ready to get married until we understand God's purpose for our life. Now, I want to say that again because some of you have kids that are going to come to you and grandkids and they're going to say, I'm ready to get married. And the first question you ought to ask them is, is there spiritual unity? Are you marrying a believer? But the second question you need to ask them is this. Do you share a life purpose? Do you share the the same life purpose? Ask them that because if you don't know what your purpose is and you get married and you discover your life purpose, then all of a sudden, what if your life purpose is not shared by the person you marry? And you have conflict immediately in the home. You see, and we talked about this a little bit this morning. God put us here for a purpose. And I want to say a little bit about that, a little more about that than I I did this morning. God did three things. He put us here for, for three reasons. First, God created you to be uniquely you. Jot down Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Did you get that? He prepared in advance for us to do. Do you know before you were born, God had already decided your purpose? God prepared in advance the things He had for you to do? One day, we're going to stand before God. And God's going to ask us two questions. The good thing about God is he tells us what's going to be on the exam in his word. He gives us these two questions. And there are only two questions on that final exam. Since God wants us to succeed, he gives us the answers in advance. These two questions. One day you'll die. Your heart will stop. And that will be the end of your body But it's not going to be the end of you because you were made to live forever in one of two places, either in heaven or in hell. We were made for a long-term relationship with God. And God wants us in heaven. And that's why he sent Jesus to die to make that possible. So one day you'll stand before God and God's going to ask you first, what did you do with my son Jesus? That's what he's going to ask you. And I hope you know the answer to that. God's not going to say, were you a Catholic or were you a Baptist or were you a Methodist or were you a Pentecostal? God's not going to ask you about your denomination. He doesn't care. God is going to say, what did you do with my son Jesus? That's the question he'll ask you. And then here's the second question. God's going to say, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with what... I gave you. You know, you have been given certain gifts and abilities and purposes, and God gave you these spiritual gifts, 
and your personality and your life experience. And he gives us all these things to fulfill the purpose for which we've been created. And when we stand before God one day, we're going to give an account. God's going to say, did you fulfill your purpose? So God uniquely created you. He gifted you. That's the second thing. He gifted you. 1 Peter 4 says, Each of you received a gift from God for serving others. Now you must be faithful to develop and use that gracious gift from God. Now listen, if you've got a life partner, a a spouse, going a different direction than, than you are, how are you going to fulfill God's purpose for you? You can't do it. You can't do it unless you share your life purpose. And Scripture says you're called. Every Christian is called by God. The Bible says marriage is a partnership to fulfill God's calling. Listen to Hebrews 3.1. It says, brothers and sisters, you are holy partners in a heavenly calling. So the purpose of marriage, one of the purposes, is to make us more effective in fulfilling our purpose. If marriage, if that marriage relationship keeps you from fulfilling your purpose, then you've missed the point. So what do you need to do? Well, picture, picture it in your mind like this, your life purpose. See, your life purpose is a circle. It's a circle. And then consider the person you're going to marry and ask about their life purpose and see their life purpose as a circle. Now, do those two circles overlap? Do those circles overlap? Is their life purpose the same as your life purpose? It's it's important to have that oneness. It's incredibly important. When I fell in love with Tanya, I did not really understand my life purpose. I didn't know all of the things God was going to ask us to do with our life. But you know what? As we talked, we recognized we had the same life purpose. We did. And when we got to know each other better and better, God just made the life purposes where those two circles just completely matched. And when you have different life purposes, you have no impact. Not only that, you have less joy. And not only that, you have more conflict. So you have to have spiritual unity, and you have to have the same life purpose the way God gives you and the way God calls you. You may both be fine people and you may both love the Lord and love each other, but that doesn't mean you should get married. You have to have the same life purpose. If you're understanding me, say amen. That's a key to relationship peace. I don't know if anybody's ever told you this or not, but I I think you've already figured it out. A bad marriage is a thousand times worse than staying single for the rest of your life. Amen? I mean, it it really is. I can't tell you how many people that I've talked to through the years, people that have been married 10, 15, 20 years, and in the privacy of a conversation, they'd say something to me like, well, Pastor, I feel guilty. I know what God called me to do, but I can't do it because I married a person who does not have that same value, and so I'm missing my purpose in life. I've had people say that. Maybe you've thought that, maybe, in your life. And that's torture, to know your purpose in life and miss it because of a relationship mistake. On the other hand, when your purpose is aligned, there's enormous power and fulfillment. So, one key to relationship peace is spiritual unity. A second key is a shared life purpose. And a third is emotional health. You have to be emotionally healthy. Be emotionally healthy. Now, I didn't say emotionally perfect. Emotionally healthy. If you wait for the perfect wife or the perfect husband, it won't happen. And let me tell you why. Because we're all sinners. All of us. You're going to marry a sinner. I married a sinner, but she married a bigger sinner than I did. I mean, we're all sinners. We're all broken. And none of us... Are, are perfect. Two imperfect people cannot make a perfect relationship. So just put that out of your mind. You're not going to have 
a perfect relationship. I heard about a lady at divorce court, and she was asking for a divorce. And the judge said, but you promised to take him for better or worse. She said, yeah, but he was a lot worse than I took him for. <laughs> what I'm saying is this. Study after study after study has been shown that 80% of all separations and divorce are because one or both marriage partners are emotionally unhealthy. Now think about that. 80% because one or both are emotionally unhealthy. So I want to give you a partial checklist tonight. I don't have time to give you all of them. but And, and by the way, these are not my opinion. These are from the Word of God. This is what, what God says about it. God says you need to avoid. And let me just give them to you. Jot down Proverbs 22:24. Proverbs 22, 24 says, Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one so easily angered. Uncontrolled anger will ruin a relationship. Uncontrolled anger is emotional, being emotionally unhealthy. It reveals deep insecurity. It reveals low self-worth. And listen, if you don't like yourself, you're not going to like anybody else. I mean, that's the truth of it. When you've got a cup, say I have a cup of water and it's, it's full to the brim and some, somebody hits my hand and what's inside that cup is going to spill out. And that's the same in our heart. What's inside our heart is going to spill out. And if you've got a guy who's filled with anger or a woman who's filled with anger, and any time you jostle them, anger is going to come out. So the Bible says run. Don't associate with somebody like that. If they don't like themselves, they're going to turn that anger on you. Second, addictions. Addictions. Proverbs 23:20 20 says, and this is a paraphrase, don't associate with people who drink too much or stuff themselves with food. Now, there are only two things mentioned. There are food and alcohol, but the application is the same. You can get addicted to drugs. You can get addicted to pornography. You can get addicted to video games. You can get addicted to, to spending. The list goes on and on. Emotionally unhealthy. And then the third one is bitterness. Bitterness. I've sat in the counseling room with marriage after marriage and watched bitterness. Just tear it down. It doesn't matter if you both have great jobs, you're both good looking, you've got great kids, you've got nice cars, you live in a big house, You've got a great family and everything. If there's bitterness, it's going to tear it up. It will just tear it all to pieces. Jot down Hebrews 12, 15. It says, make sure you all have experienced the grace of God so that bitterness doesn't take root and grow because that causes much trouble and will corrupt. First time I saw bitterness in action was over 30 years ago as a pastor. It was over 30 years ago. First church I pastored, I was a seminary student. Didn't know a thing, wet behind the ears. Still don't know much, you know that. But I didn't know anything then. And this couple who had been married, and, and this is true and it's unbelievable, they'd been married for, I think 50, is either 50, 51 years. They were up in years. And they had a falling out with each other. And they were very bitter. And so they separated. And she moved out and got an apartment. And he was living at home. It was the silliest thing I had ever seen in my life. And so they said, would you talk with us? I said, sure, I'll talk with you. So... We met down at the church one night and in the fellowship hall, and we put a table. I, I set a table up in the fellowship hall, put two chairs on one side of the table and one chair on the other side, put two legal pads at those two chairs. They came in. I said, have a seat. Set them beside of each other. I sat across from them. And I said to them, now, before we start to talk, here are the ground rules. We're here to attack the problem. We're not here to attack each other. Now, if you 
want to attack the problem, I'll help you, and we'll work this out. But if you attack each other one time, just one time, I'm going to get up and go home. Well, we started, or they started. And I kid you not, I was not in there for five minutes before they unloaded on each other. They weren't talking about the problems. They were after each other. I didn't say a word. I just got up. I walked over to the door. The light switch was beside the door. I turned the light out, left them in the dark, got in my car, and went home. <laughs> they sat there in the dark. They told me this later. They, I mean, they were eating up with bitterness at each other. But they sat there in the dark and thought about how stupid they were acting, about how dumb they had been to each other to act that way. And sitting there in the fellowship hall with the lights out, they got their hearts right with each other. And they reconciled. And God allowed them to have a good marriage until a few years later when uh, they both died. Bitterness will do strange things. Bitterness will make good people act like the devil. And so avoid bitterness at all costs. A girl who has issues with her dad, I guarantee you, will take that out on her husband. And ladies, if you want to know how your husband is going to treat you, then you look at how he treats his parents. Now, that's, that, you remember that. If you want to know how he'll treat you, you look at how he treats his parents and see what kind of respect especially that the guy has for his mom. Look at that. I've seen it over and over and over again. The Bible says make sure you have all experienced the grace of God. So get rid of the bitterness. Then there's selfishness. Selfishness. Proverbs 28, 25 says selfish people cause trouble. Uh, I would just say write that scripture down in the margin of your Bible and circle it and put a star beside of it and an exclamation point and underline it and put an arrow beside of it. Selfish people cause trouble. Just look at it. I mean, teach your kids to look for these signs when they're dating. Uh, teach your girls to look and see if the guy ever opens the door for them. The number one cause of conflict in marriage when y'all boil it when you boil it all down is just selfishness. It, it it is because I do not get what I want and you do not get what you want. And selfish people are unwilling to budge. They're immature. It's selfish. And the more unselfish we are, the more difficult we are to get along with. It responds back to each other. Proverbs eighteen one says People who do not get along with others are only interested in themselves. They will disagree with what everyone else knows is right. <laughs> do you know anybody like that? I mean, they just disagree about it. I've got a friend who pastors a church in Tennessee, and he said there's a couple uh, in his church that just votes no on everything. And he said it's bad. I mean, they just they won't vote yes for anything that goes on in the church. And, and he said one Sunday they were having a church conference and he just got up and said, go ahead and vote no and then we'll vote on it. Because he knew that they were, now he shouldn't have done that, but he did. Uh, because he knew that, that they were going to vote no. And that's what scripture's talking about. That's selfishness. That's just disagreeable people. And one of the clearest signs of being emotionally unhealthy it's selfishness. And you know what the Scripture says we're to do? Run from people like that. Run from them. That's what God says we should do. Now, our culture teaches us the exact opposite of what God's Word teaches. Our culture teaches us that the number one thing you need in marriage is to be good-looking. Now, think about this. Our entire society is built on the idea that you marry somebody beautiful and if you marry somebody beautiful, your marriage is going to be great and you're going to be happy and they're going to meet every need in your life. If that were true, then the marriages that would last the longest would be the Hollywood marriages. <laughs> Isn't that right? I mean, they're better looking than all the rest of us. Do Hollywood marriages last the longest? I don't think so. 
If you think that's true, ask Kim Kardashian what she thinks about it. I mean, really, not a chance. It has zero to do with the success of your marriage. And I hate to tell you this, but uh, you're not going to look good forever. (laughs) This Hollywood myth that all you need to get married is romantic feelings and sexual attractions and, and get rid of your loneliness and everything will be great, but that's not true. Here's the truth. Do you have spiritual unity? Do you have a shared life purpose? Are you emotionally healthy? And I want to challenge you to commit yourself tonight to these three keys of relationship peace and commit yourself to teaching these to your children and to your grandchildren so that they will understand how to make godly decisions in their relationships. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand together. And as we sing tonight, if you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, or you would like to come and be a member of this church, we invite you to come forward and make those decisions right now.